insights that she provided um, really completely changed the way people thought about the genetic underpinning of cancer. Dr. Raleigh has always been a very inspiring mentor. Um, everything from science related to non-science related life. Well, Janet Rowley has been uh, not only a creative uh, and productive scientist in the laboratory, but she's been a, a spokesperson for uh, the whole direction that uh, clinical research is going. It's really an amazing experience because it's having a wealth of knowledge right next door to you at any point in time. You can hardly find people that have had more impact uh, in, uh, in our generation. Um, I've known Dr. Rowley since I was very young, since I um, came to America, I think when I was four, and um, she used to be my dad's mentor. And so now it's very cool to be working in such a prestigious lab. She absolutely loves science. She is so inquisitive. She gets excited about the smallest little result. In 1960, when Peter Noel and David Hungerford discovered the Philadelphia chromosome, it was commonly thought that it was comprised of a shortened chromosome number 22. It was not until 13 years later that a doctor doing research using a new staining technique determined that the Philly chromosome was actually made up of remnant pieces from chromosomes 9 and 22. This translocation of genetic material is the hallmark of CML. The doctor responsible for the discovery was Dr. Janet D. Rowley. Janet Rowley was born in 1925 in New York City. When she was three, her family relocated to Chicago. Dr. Rowley still lives there today. Her parents both excelled in their field, and young Janet would grow to do the same. At the age of 15, she was admitted to a program for junior and senior high school students at the University of Chicago. Her voracious love of the sciences kept her focused and the program molded her for life. My interest in, in science uh, really began in high school. Uh, the first two years I was in high school, I went to Mercy High School here in the city of Chicago on the south side. I had uh, two classes, one general science and then one in zoology as a sophomore. And they were, um, they were fascinating. And then I had good classes at the University of Chicago. And finally, the third year of the four-year college, I took a general bi -sci course, and that clinched it. So I was firstly involved in physiology, but then I decided that medicine was really uh, much more interesting uh, and working with patients and trying to do something that could help some patients. When children came along, Dr. Rowley continued to practice medicine part-time in area clinics juggling the duties of wife, mother, doctor, and researcher. I think because my mother uh, was employed full-time out of the house that I decided that I wanted to be able to spend more time with my children. And as a result, I worked in uh, clinics where I didn't have set responsibilities. And I would, um, that's what I did both in Maryland when we were there, when my husband was at the National Institutes of Health. And then when we came back to Chicago, to the University of Chicago, I was working part-time in clinics and he was doing research here at the university. He went to England on sabbatical and I, of course, went with him with our three children. And I got involved in a research project that I liked that had to do with chromosomes. I then decided that I didn't want to go back to the clinic, but rather wanted to continue on with research. But I also needed to be able to do it part-time. And I approached one of my former professors about uh, working part-time uh, at the university on a research project having to do with chromosomes. And he didn't know um, very much about chromosomes or my project, which was totally different than anything that that he was interested in, but he said, yes, I could uh, complete my project and have the use of uh, a microscope and a dark room 
And then I had the chutzpah to ask him if I would, if he'd pay me, and he said yes. So I was uh, paid for working part time on a project of my own interest. Um, but I think that speaks for at least uh, some of the people at the university that are willing to take a, um, a, a chance on a very risky uh, proposition. This opportunity set Rowley on the path to discovering the translocation responsible for CML. And Dr. Jacobson was a hematologist, and so every so often he'd ask me uh, if I'd look at chromosomes of some of his patients, particularly CML patients, because it had been discovered in 1960 uh, by Nolan Hungerford that the, there was a unique uh, marker chromosome called the Philadelphia chromosome in CML patients. And so I, of course, would, would say yes to Dr. Jacobson after he'd been so kind to me. And so I built up a collection of, of uh, samples from patients with, with CML. A second trip to Europe provided an opportunity for Raleigh to learn a new technique for staining chromosomes. My husband then went back to uh, Oxford on a second sabbatical. I went with him and I learned uh, a new technique called banding, which was really magical because before that, we'd look at chromosomes, they were uniformly stained and you, you could sort of tell one from another because there are big ones and little ones and ones with um, sort of a constriction in the middle and others with a constriction at one end, but that was a pretty gross separation. And instead, uh, now with banding, you could tell every chromosome apart. And not only that, you could see portions of chromosomes as well. So when I was looking at cells from patients with CML, I started out first looking at uh, cells from patients in blast crisis because they had extra chromosomes and I wondered what the extra chromosomes were and with banding I'd be able to tell. Raleigh would photograph the chromosomes while in the lab, take them home, cut them apart like a paper doll project, arrange them in numerically ordered pairs, then study them for any anomalies. Prior to discovering the 922 translocation, Raleigh had discovered another translocation that played into the development of another form of leukemia. As a result, she was particularly interested in looking into other leukemias to determine if translocations were a trait of these blood cancers. As I said, I work only part-time, so I could take photographs of the chromosomes at the university and then I take the photographs home and analyze them at home on my quotes days off. Uh, and I did this in my dining room table, cutting out the chromosomes and arranging them according to a set uh, nomenclature. Uh, and I noticed and I could identify the extra chromosomes, but what caught my attention was the fact that in addition to the Philadelphia chromosome, these uh, chromosomes from the several patients that I looked at all had extra material on chromosome nine, at the bottom of the long arm of chromosome nine. And it looked just like the banding pattern of the, of the missing piece of the Philadelphia chromosome. I had previously, about six months earlier, found a uh, translocation in an acute leukemia patient. So I thought, well, uh, this looks like a second translocation in a, in a different uh, disease, of, though still leukemia. But there were many questions. This was, after all, blast, blast crisis, and maybe the patients just had um, that translocation of coming from somewhere else as a consequence of blast crisis. But I had chronic phase samples from many of the same patients, and so I looked at the chronic phase, and there was the 922 translocation on the chronic phase patients' uh, samples as well. And then, of course, you could say, well, maybe it was a, just a genetic abnormality that they might have had. So I could get the patients back, uh, some of them that were, were still living, and do a peripheral blood on them for normal cells, not leukemic cells. And their normal cells had a perfectly normal karyotype. So that was proof to me that the uh, Philadelphia chromosome in CML was the result of a translocation. And I have to say that was really a, an aha moment. 
and I knew that I'd hit the jackpot. Once the discovery was made, Rowley went about making it public. I wrote a letter to Nature describing my um, observations and got back a rejection saying uh, some of the things I hadn't yet had a chance to do, the peripheral blood, so one of the concerns was maybe this was a genetic abnormality. By the time I got the rejection, I had studied seven patients and had the peripheral blood, and so I could write a much more detailed report, and that was accepted. Then the problem was that this was, maybe it was accepted in March or April, and I was just very impatient for it to come out because I was telling everybody, and it was an easy discovery, and you know, this is not rocket science, just, just looking at chromosomes. And so somebody else could do the same thing and write to, to a journal that would publish it right away, of which I expected Nature to publish it right away, because uh, I mean I, I thought it was an important discovery. Anyhow, it was discovered. It was uh, published in late Jan uh, June, and so that's um, that's the beginning of that story. The science is what drives Janet, right? Um, but when you think about somebody first as a colleague, it's usually a personal trait. And uh, for Janet, that would be energy, persistence, um, and focus. She really inspires you to achieve more. And the way that she does that is in a very um, maternal or grandmotherly fashion. Um, she, she is um, a, a you know, a mentor and a colleague in the best sense. She allows you independence. She has a very good sense of the right touch at how much guidance to provide individuals. But because she's always asking the right question, she always has a laser, laser focus on the most exciting questions in science, she keeps you focused. And I think that's particularly important for junior people because junior people often um, have a tendency to, to think too broadly. So she's been on the forefront of uh, recruiting women into science and I think is uh, widely recognized as, uh, as a role model for uh, young women who are interested in uh, clinical or translational science. Uh, you know, she is just a delight to have as a member of our faculty. She is an outstanding scientist. She is extraordinarily modest given all of her contributions. She is a wonderful mentor to students, to, to postdoctoral fellows, to clinical fellows, to junior faculty, uh, and um, she's a national treasure and we're glad that she's ours. Thank you.